Hello everyone and thanks for joining us today for our e-learning opportunity. Um, we appreciate all of our presenters for all the time they've put into these presentations in such a short time. <laughs> During the presentation you may come up with questions. If you do, please use the Q&A or the chat features at the bottom of your screen. Both of those will come to me and then I'll share all the questions with Antonio at the end of the presentation. At the end of the presentation I will be um, uh, sending out a poll for a survey and if you don't mind filling that out to let us know what you thought of the presentation today that would be great. Um, and if you haven't gone to onto our website in the last few weeks, we've added a bunch new of um, presentations that'll come up in the future. Um, some middle of July all the way through October, I think we've got up there. So check that out. I'll share that link at the end of the presentation. Uh, now I want to turn it over into Antonio Crisa. He's going to teach on Italian numismatics insights through modern history. Enjoy. Okay. So welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to present this uh, short talk on Italian numismatics. So I'm um, mainly an historian and uh, numismatist, but also an archaeologist. So my idea of numismatics is um, mostly based on the analysis of coins which are related to history. So today I'm going to speak on the history of Italy and also uh, the history of coins. So these two elements are uh, strictly related. Um, I think it's, um, I should say that it's quite impossible to speak on Italian numismatics uh, within 45 minutes. Uh, so this is a huge topic, um, especially because numismatics in Italy is quite complex, um, mostly that one of uh, the modern age. Uh, there are many coinages, um, there are so many coins uh, which have been issued, which is impossible to describe uh, everything within 45 minutes. So that's why today I'm going to uh, focus on some case studies of Italian numismatics. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to be more focused on the modern period instead of the medieval one. Um, let's, uh, let's start to see the main um, topics of uh, my talk of today. Okay, uh, so first of all, um, I'll, um, I'll try to give you some examples on numismatics before the modern age. Uh, so we will try to understand um, what was numismatics before uh, 1492. Um, and then uh, we will see uh, the evolution of numismatics uh, we, in, in the modern age. Um, I'd like to, to focus mostly on Sicily uh, in the modern period. Uh, why? Uh, first of all, it's probably the, 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 main, uh, the main subject or geographical area of my research. Uh, both on numismatics, on history and archaeology. And then, uh, after all, it's quite intriguing because there are uh, many examples of coinages uh, and there is a variety of, of coins within this period between 16th and 19th century. Um, then I'm going to speak about the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Uh, so we will uh, see some coins uh, and some um, historical characters of that period. And then uh, the Kingdom of Italy. So that's the connection between the pre-unification and the post-unification period. So when Italy became a state. Um, and we will see how numismatics change. And then I'll give you some conclusion uh, at the end. So in this picture, in these slides, you can see some of uh, the coins that um, probably are related to this talk. So we, we have a, a coin of uh, Philip III um, struck in Sicily, and then another coin of Ferdinand, of Ferdinand IV, uh, 1796. And then finally a coin, which is completely different uh, in terms of historical period, uh, which is a coin uh, issued by Victor Emmanuel II. Uh, so you have in this slide a sort of variety of uh, coinages, uh, and you can see a bit of the, the evolution in terms of uh, realizing the portrait, the, the use of different types, and so on. 
but let's let's go on um before going going on with um, modern numismatics of italy i'd like to give you this short introduction on um what was numismatics before the modern age so in this nice picture that you can see on the on the right so that's a map um you can see italy so italy as you know is a peninsula and this map uh, of course is totally different from the map that we have today so today italy is one nation and um it's um italy is like a booth you can see it's this, this is the shape uh, but in um, in uh, in 1494 uh, italy was uh, uh, we should say did not exist as a state so it was a, um, a sort of um, uh, it comprises many many states um, but is it was not like a federation like like the us so it's completely different there were states which were totally different one each other so there were many rules and uh, that's of course implied that there were many coins and many coinages because all these these um these lords and these uh kings and and so on and so on uh, were striking issuing coin and uh, so that's why we have this variety of coinages. Um, so there were many, many rulers uh, in Italy. Um, but one of the advantages of this period is, is that uh, there was a flourishing of art, of culture, and as you know, is the period of the, um, the Renaissance. So you have an example, which is quite famous here. It's, it's a painting of, um, of um, Botticelli, which is now in Florence. Uh, so that's that's also stimulated um, a great um, uh, revival of uh, the study of antiquities, uh, the classical studies, the antiquarian studies, and so on. So it was uh, like a dynamic contest. Um, now we will um, we will assess very rapidly two uh, two example of uh, uh, numismatics before uh, the modern age. So in this slide, um, you can see a coin, a silver coin, uh, which was called Grosso. Uh, Grosso literally in Italian means big, um, but that's a kind of name that it was given to this coin. And it's a silver coin uh, issued in Milan uh, by, Milan was a dukedom in, in, um, in, uh, in that period, so in, uh, uh, early 15th century and the coin was issued by uh, Gian Galeazzo Visconti. Um, the legend that you can see here, it's in Latin, uh, but you can have an idea of the name of the duke, which is here, Galeaz, um, and then Mediolani, which is in Latin means uh, of Milan. Um, so we notice uh, in terms of iconography uh, that we have on the on the obverse uh, the symbol of the duke dome and it's this nice and big snake which is called in italian biscione so it's it's a big snake and it's typical of the family of visconti sometimes if you go i mean if you go in milan you can still see uh, this um, this coat of arm, um, and then on the on the reverse, that's quite important. We have the the image of the saint, a saint, Saint Ambrose, who is uh, still the, the official saint of Milan. So the coin represents like a good example of what what was the uh, the trend of Italian numismatics in that period. So we have the sacred. Uh, the, um, the religious um, iconography, which is associated with the civic uh, iconography. So we have a saint and we have the, the symbol of um, the person who was ruling the city. Um, let's go on. So that's the second example. Um, probably you know these coins, they were extremely uh, widespread in um, in 15th century. So this is a Fiorino. Uh, 
um, just the word Fiorino is, is related to Florence and uh, the most uh, uh, interesting aspect in terms of the iconography is the presence of this uh, lily on, on the obverse, which is the symbol of Florence. And um, the coin is also, as we have seen in Milan, um, essential for the presence of another saint. So we have Saint John, uh, which is standing and facing, um, and uh, is, is the same that we have seen in Milan, but the saint change. Um, what we can notice is this T, which is, which is of course uh, the symbol of the person who was responsible for issuing the coin. Um, this coin was uh, issued in the period of the famous uh, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, as you know. Uh, one of the aspects of medieval numismatics is that there is an evolution of the iconography. So in the early stages, quite, um, there are not so many details, but then as soon as you go on, you have more and more details. If you can see how the saint is full of details, you can see also the, the dress here. But if we want to be quick, let's, let's go on with, um, with the following period, so which is the modern numismatics. So I'm not going to speak on all the coinages that we had in Italy after the end of 15th century, because it, it would be really demanding. Maybe we need like uh, an entire course, 20 classes, maybe, maybe more. Uh, anyway, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, we have a new map of Italy, which is a bit different if you compare that with the previous one. Uh, so the political uh, situation of Italy changed a bit. Why? Because in the 16th century, we have, um, we have a different uh, uh, like organization of the, the Italian states that the historian called the pre-unification states. Um, what we notice is that we have more and more major states like the state of the church, which is now uh, still present in Italy, is the Vatican, uh, which goes also uh, in Bologna, for instance. For instance. Uh, but mostly we notice that all the south part of Italy, including also the highlands, Sardinia and Sicily, was ruled by the Spanish. So that's the, um, the, there were different kingdoms but the, the unique ruler was represented by the Spanish. And that's the Spanish domination, which, which was quite long standing until the early 18th century. Uh, Sicily was uh, uh, quite important uh, in that period because it was a crossroad for commerce um, and uh, there were many routes, uh, of merchants, so for fishing was quite important. There was a production of many, many gods which were exported as well. Um, so that's, that's uh, an important aspect uh, because also that stimulates um, a big economy and so the production of, of coins. There were too many means in, um, in Sicily, so Messina and Palermo. Um, but then this, this change, of course, uh, in the following uh, centuries. We have different rulers, so we have uh, here a sort of list of rulers. Uh, the first one, we, who is probably the most famous, is Charles V, and um, he was also um, very famous and powerful. But then we have also Philip II, so you have all these names which, which um, which are related, the second, the third, the fourth, and then Charles the second and Philip the fourth. Um, so, but most of the coins were quite standard in terms of iconography. And then we are going through some examples. Okay, for instance, um, one of the, um, uh, the, um, the main aspect of the Sicilian numismatics in that period is that, um, 
we we start to have a sort of uh, standard system uh, so i'm not going through all the aspects of of this but the most important element that i'd like to to pinpoint is um, is that the unit uh, in sicilian numismatics was the tari um, and this coin for instance uh, is a scudo uh, it's called scudo which which literally means shield in italian um, and we will also have scudi for instance in the following period in piedmont and so on uh, and this is equal to 10 tari uh, so it was a um, a silver coin um, which was um, issued in um, struck in the mint of uh, Messina if I'm not wrong uh, and you can see that uh, we have a nice uh, picture image of, of the king so Philip the the second is represented on the right and if you see the dress is typical of that period, so of late 16th century. Um, and uh, is not a proper armor, but there are some coins in which you can see these kings which uh, who are uh, wearing uh, a full armor as well. Um, but that's the typical way of dressing in that period. Um, what we can see as well is, is a reverse which has some elements which are very symbolic. Um, first of all, we have a legend in Latin, um, which is quite, uh, quite, um, quite essential for the meaning. So it means that these coins wa was made, was issued for, uh, for the, um, to favoring uh, the, the public. So, uh, so that, that's why the king was producing the coins but on top of that we have spikes can you see here there is a, a series of spikes uh, which uh, are mostly um, connected to Sicily itself because Sicily as you know uh, has always been in, important for the production of grain it was conquered by the Romans for this reason as well uh, so there is a connection between the power of the king and uh, the production of grain uh, for all the people of Sicily. Uh, let's try to go on. Um, now uh, I'd like to, to share with you, um, uh, like um, anticipating some results of, of one of my recent research that I've done in Palermo. So I, I show you this slide because I've done this this um, investigation in Palermo, which, which have been really intriguing in my opinion. So a few years ago, I realized that um, just searching in archives, um, there was a, a hoard, a coin hoard, which was fully unknown by the scholars. So I decided to go uh, to the Museum of Palermo. And there I found this hoard, um, what is an ore? As you know, it um, can be considered an, like an accumulation of coins. Someone say more than three coins for an ore. Uh, but anyway, sometimes we have thousands of coins in one hoard. This coin hoard um, was, uh, was not so big, less than 100 coins. And it was found in Palermo in 1872. Um, along this uh, road that you can see here, it's, um, it's one of the main roads that we have in Palermo called Via Maqueda. And, um, and when the city council was performing some construction there, they found this uh, hoard, which was rescued by the, um, the, the curator of the Museum of Palermo. So um, the coins that I found uh, after more than 100 years um, are 70, uh, 76, but originally they were 89 when they were discovered. Um, so the, the hoard can represent uh, like uh, uh, an ideal um, uh, bit of the circulation of coins in that period. 
in Palermo. So you can see that we have the association of many, many coins of different rulers, uh, mostly uh, um, struck in, uh, in Messina. Uh, but also we have these coins uh, struck, uh, issued by, by these knights of Malta. So that's probably the most fascinating aspect of this coin or, um, so you, you can see that you have coins of Sicily associated with coins from Malta. That also testifies uh, what I was saying before, that the economics was quite dynamic in that period. So Sicily was a crossroad of routes and there were, um, there were also many pirates. There was a, also a commerce of slaves. Uh, um, there was an exportation of grains and so on. So that, that store can testify the association of these many coins. Um, I think uh, time is running. Uh, so we are going through uh, a different period. Um, I'm sorry if I have to jump up, but uh, of course uh, we can't uh, go on through all the coins. So I just present you, presenting you some case studies. And um, as you probably know, uh, after, um, after the, um, the end of uh, 18th century, uh, Napoleon uh, became more and more powerful and also um, uh, created, established a sort of protectorate um, in, the, in the whole kingdom of the two Sicilies. And uh, the ruler uh, was not uh, Napoleon, but uh, one of his relatives, uh, Gioacchino Murat, that uh, you can see in this, um, on the obverse of this coin, uh, who is uh, reported as Gioacchino Napoleone in the legend. Um, so uh, I, I, I have chosen this coin because it's, it's stunning for the, the, the amount of details that you have in the portrait. You can see here, uh, you can see all the hair uh, which are fully detailed. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see air uh, which are going through the through the here as well. You can see a bit of the beer of the of the um, of Joaquino and so on. And this is this is a really uh, valuable coin, forty lire. It's a gold coin, uh, very rare today as well. Um, what you can notice is that uh, you have uh, a dating element which is quite easy now because we are in 19th century so the, the coins were more and more standardized uh, instead of uh, other uh, dating element that we had here for instance can you see it's a bit it's less clear but still it's 1587 um, uh, so uh, the one of the the element that I like to underline is the language of the coin. So uh, as you notice, it's not Latin anymore. Uh, it's Italian. Uh, so both the name and the, um, the legend of the kingdom of the two Sicilies uh, are in uh, in Italian uh, language as well as the nominal value lire. Uh, so that's a, a new, um, a new uh, trend, but it's it changed after a few years, as we will see. Let's go on. Uh, um, what happens after uh, Napoleon? So there was a big restoration uh, of the old kingdoms, and uh, Sicily and southern Italy uh, became, again, the kingdom of the two Sicilies until the unification of Italy. Um, in this period, we have two main capital cities, uh, and we, we have less means, uh, which uh, were producing uh, in minting coins, uh, mostly Palermo uh, uh, and, um, and Naples, but then Naples will be the, the main one, um, because Naples was the capital city of all the kingdom of, Jesus, uh, of the two Sicilies, uh, even if Palermo uh, was uh, the, the, the less important capital city of, of uh, Sicily. 
because the kingdom was divided ideally by the Strait of Messina. Uh, the situation in terms of uh, internal politics was not so good uh, for all the period uh, of time. Uh, we have some big uprisings, um, especially in Sicily, because Sicily was not uh, um, um, in a good position like, like Naples and the southern part of Italy, which, is, which was more rich, was richer than, than Sicily. Um, uh, but still, we had also the development of museums and new universities. So there were like uh, um, good aspect and uh, less good aspect of uh, the, the policy of the kings of the two Sicilies. Uh, that was the historical context. Let's go on with some examples the, that we have here uh, of the numismatics of that period. So in these coins, um, which, is, um, which is made of copper, um, you can see uh, the, the king uh, who ruled for the, the, for the longest period in, in, that, in, in that kingdom, uh, with Ferdinand II. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, now the coins are very standardized. So you have the portrait and then you have a regular legend. Um, so also they are very, um, very um, regular in terms of shape. Um, and then you have, you have the languages which are like two languages. Um, as you can notice on the, on the obverse, you, you still have the Latin. Why? There is a, a propagandistic reason. Um, so the, the king was willing to, to keep the, the Latin because it was a, like a sign of uh, prestige as well. That's why the, the legend of the king is reported in Latin. Uh, and this is the traditional legend, which means Ferdinand II uh, king of the two Sicilies uh, and also Jerusalem, so that's an old title uh, for the, the um, willing of God. Um, uh, and then you have the crown of the Bourbon, so that's very standardized. Um, now I'm going to present you um, a, a coin uh, which is not so important uh, for the coin itself, but for two elements. Uh, which uh, which came uh, after the coin was issued. Um, but before uh, speaking about this, um, I'd like to describe this coin. So uh, the coin is issued uh, has been issued by the same ruler. So you have Ferdinand II, but uh, the king is uh, is very young here, and you can see the differences. So, uh, as you see, it's very young. So the coin was issued in 1836. So the king was young in that period. And this is a, a, a silver coin. Um, it was a common coin. Uh, so a piastra um, of 120 grana. Uh, here you can see also the indication of the of the catalog, uh, MIR is uh, Monete Italiane, Re Italiane Regionali, uh, and PR is Pannuti Riccio. Um, but what I'd like to stress is the presence of these two short legends, which have been made by, um, by two countermarks, uh, which are really funny and also fascinating for the relationship with history that they have. Uh, so uh, the first one is Olim. Olim is a Latin word which is once upon a time, which means Ferdinand II, once upon a time was a king. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, on the neck this uh, countermass which, which means bomb, bomb in Italian means bomb. Why we have this countermass? So these countermarks were put on many coins, um, especially the, the silver one, after 1848, when we have the big uprising in Sicily. Ferdinand II uh, could not um, manage uh, the uprising, so he decided to bomb Messina. That's why it was called Re Bomba, so the king, uh, the king bomb. 
And that's why the, the rebels uh, decided to protest and, and put these countermarks on, on the coin. So you notice how coins could be uh, like um, a very uh, effective means of propaganda also against uh, politicians and against kings as we have here. So maybe I'd like to write uh, a, a short paper on this topic uh, for the numismatics. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, now um, uh, an example of medals. So um, also in that period, medals were, uh, were produced and they were related to historical period. And in this stunning medal, uh, which is a big one, so 73 millimeter, you have again Ferdinand II uh, that you can see here uh, as, a, as a high level um, uh, soldier. So you, you, have, you can see all the dress and all these details. So these are the decorations. Uh, and then you have this detailed scene in which you can see the celebration of the new uh, railway, which was uh, just made in Naples. So uh, Naples had the first railway in Italy ever made. Uh, so that's a, a, a celebrative medal, we can say. And so you can see these, uh, these scenes, which are on different levels, and you can see the um, the Royal Palace of Caserta here. Um, now, uh, what happens after uh, 1860? So in 1860, uh, this guy that you probably know is the national hero of Italy uh, called Giuseppe Garibaldi, landed in Sicily uh, in the small town of Marsala, which is on the western part of Sicily, together with 1,000 men and uh, soldiers who were called uh, camicie rosse because they were wearing a, a shirt which was red. And uh, they, they, they defeated the Bourbon troops in Sicily and then they conquered Southern Italy as well. Uh, so that was the starting of a new kingdom um, because then Garibaldi gave all the new territories uh, liber liberated by the Bourbon and part of the Vatican, uh, to the uh, new Italian king, who was uh, um, elected as Victor Emmanuel II, who was previously king of uh, Piedmont and Sardinia. Um, and that was also a sort of um, uh, new, uh, new deal for Italian numismatics, so it's like a turning point in terms of coin production. Why? Because now Sicily um, became a part of, of Italy, so, and Italy was a new kingdom, so we, have, we had one coinage. So all the previous coins were uh, like uh, gathered and then destroyed, so we had just one coinage. Uh, we have less means as well. Um, when we have the unification, uh, there were uh, still um, a few means, so Milan, Turin, Florence, and Rome. Remember that the three capital cities were Turin, Florence, and Rome. Uh, in late 19th century, we will have just one mint, which was Rome, and this still is the official mint of Italy, even if we don't have the lira anymore. Uh, that was more important, uh, more uh, convenient in terms of um, uh, producing a distributing the coins. And uh, you see that the coin is very standardized. We have also the mint mark, which is here, M stand for Milan. Um, and uh, you always have uh, the uh, Italian legend, so the Latin is not there anymore. Uh, let's go on. Um, we, we said that the first kings, uh, king of, of Italy was Victor Emmanuel II. Uh, so the second one was uh, Umberto I, Umberto I, who was killed, who was assassinated by an anarchist in Milan. Uh, and after him, uh, we have a new king uh, who is called Victor Emmanuel III. Victor Emmanuel III um, was, um, was a controversial king for many aspects, mostly because 
um, uh, he didn't um, do a strong opposition against the fascism. But for us, uh, who are uh, numismatists, uh, Victor Emmanuel III uh, um, is, uh, I don't know if you know that, but uh, he was a very well-known numismatist. Um, and he also, um, uh, also brought down uh, a, a big uh, um, work on Italian numismatics, which is still used for uh, coin cataloging in many <clears throat> means. It's called Corpus Numorum Italicorum. So he was a great numismatist. Uh, and uh, he was also a, um, a very um, passionate collector of coins. So he had more than 120,000 coins uh, who finally donated to the, uh, the New Republic of Italy uh, in 1945, so after the Second World War, uh, when he was exiled in, uh, in Egypt. So it was a good, uh, good donation. Uh, the coins are still uh, here in this uh, museum, which is called Palazzo Massimo alle Terme in Rome. Now we are going to see some aspect of this uh, uh, last part of Italian numismatics. Um, and especially we can see the connection um, and uh, between these two historical character, Mussolini on the, on the left and Victor Emmanuel III on the right. Let's start with this coin. Uh, so this coin is um, it's, it's a masterpiece of, uh, of uh, political propaganda and um, uh, the use of iconography uh, in terms of political propaganda and so on. Uh, we have on the obverse um, the portrait of the king so you see the king uh, who is wearing an helmet. So this is the typical helmet of Italian soldier that you can still see when you watch like a, <clears throat> a documentary on First World War. Uh, the Italian soldiers were wearing this helmet. So this is like the king soldier, the king. Uh, but this king was also uh, very, um, very passionate. Uh, of uh, his soldier because uh, um, he went often on the, on the trenches to visit the Italian troops during First World War. So there are some historical uh, documentaries that, um, that show this. Uh, and uh, um, on the right, you see that um, you have, of course, I Italia, which is, of course, Italy, uh, and you have elements of the fascist uh, propaganda or uh, itself the fascism. We have an iconography which is strictly correlated to the fascism and this is, this, is the fascist uh, which was carried on by, um, by, um, by the Romans in some kind of ceremonies. And then you have the indication of the date in Roman num numerals and below that you have this which is a dot Six, uh, six, which means is the year, anno, uh, the sixth year after the fascism started. So it's the sixth year of the fascist uh, era. Uh, we are in 1928, so it's six years after the march on Rome by Mussolini. And uh, you have also the, the lion, uh, which is related to the legend that you have here. It's a motto. Uh, I'll, uh, I read that in Italian, then I translate it. Meglio vivere un giorno da leoni che cento anni da pecora. So uh, that means it's, it's better to live one day as lions, uh, that's 100 years as sheep. Uh, so that means being brave and like fight in case of war and, and uh, be always brave, um, like another one which is Memento Audere Semper, uh, but that is Latin. So you can see this, this strict connection on coins between, uh, between politics uh, and propaganda and so on. Another one is this one. Uh, this is a gold coin so Victor, of Victor Emmanuel the third, which is here. Now you can see the uniform here. Um, and then the, the legend, which is in, uh, in Italian, as I said. And uh, on the reverse, on the reverse, uh, you have a representation of 
a working uh, Roman littore, so is the career of the fascius, um, and uh, is walking, uh, but his typical dress is the toga, so he's wearing like a Roman uh, character. And still, uh, you can see the indication of the fascist uh, uh, ER, which is the ninth in this case. Uh, the quality of the coinage was very high because also uh, the, the king was a numismatist. Uh, but you will never find an association of, of coins with Mussolini. So Mussolini like uh, um, was made in a sort of uh, indirect propaganda, but you will never find his, uh, if I'm not wrong, his um, portrait, just one case on a medal, but it's not a coin. So you can see how the king was still ruling, but effectively Mussolini was the dictator. So coins are very fascinating for this aspect. Uh, now, uh, just um, um, like a curiosity, um, um, so you know that uh, the Americans uh, landed in Sicily in 1943 to liberate Sicily from the Nazi and also to defeat the Italian army. Um, this occurred in July 1943 for, during the operation Husky. Uh, that's one of the aspects of my new research on also on Sicily and cultural heritage that I'm conducting at the University of, of uh, Ghent. Um, we have a new um, kind of uh, banknote or we should say um, currency which was circulating in, in all the liberated territories. Uh, so Sicily was the first uh, region which was uh, uh, occupied by the Italian, by the American Allied Army, and as it's the first region in which uh, we have the uh, so-called American lira, which circulated. Um, so uh, that was a good, um, like, um, like um, um, a good action from the Americans because they were trying to stimulate um, the um, the economics, which was. Uh, in a bad condition for the war. Uh, and then uh, they started to, um, to distribute these, um, these banknotes. You have one lira, two lira, 10, and 100 lira. Um, and then we will have the Italian lira, which officially started in 1946, when we decided to have, we, because I'm Italian, I'm saying that, we decided to have a republic instead of a kingdom. Um, and that was my last slide. Um, now I have, um, I think, a few minutes, and um, still um, I'd like to show you some um, uh, resources that you can, uh, you can possibly use to go through Italian numismatics. Um, actually, you also have the World Coin Catalog, uh, we, which has a section on Italian numismatics, um, but also you have these uh, these sources that you can use. Um, I was thinking about uh, the main sources, but they are in Italian. Sometimes there are sources in English. Um, but this is the main one for Italian numismatics. So on the left, you have uh, the main uh, journal uh, for uh, like the academic journal, which is called Rivista Italiana di Numismatica. So it's the journal of the Italian Journal of Numismatics. Uh, it's a regular one every year, uh, and then, then it's similar to the one that you have in the US, uh, the AGN, the American Journal of Numismatics. And by the way, if you are interested, interested on this issue of 2019, I guess, you will have the, the um, you can read the, the, the article on the, the Via Maqueda order, which is coming now, then you have also some website. This is a good portal, which is called Il Giornale della Numismatica. Um, it's an update site in which we have plenty of papers on Italian numismatics and events like exhibitions uh, and also um, um, like uh, similar events that the uh, ANA organize in, in the US. But uh, it's in Italian, and of course, now there are not so many events for the uh, current situation. Uh, 
Uh, on the bottom, finally, you have um, a catalog, the main one that, that you have in, um, in Italy, it's called Gigante, and it's, uh, it's, um, it's printed every year, so you have uh, all the prices of the coin if you are a collector. Okay, finally, a few conclusions uh, just in one minute. Um, so what we have seen is just uh, um, uh, a, a sort of selection of case studies on Italian numismatics, which as you have seen, is extremely multidisciplinary. So you have plenty of connection with history, also art, politics, social studies, and so on. So we have a huge variety of, of conages uh, for different periods, which are related to the, to the fragmentary uh, situation of Italy. And then you have many rulers and many colleges as well. Um, so I think I'm, uh, I have it done because it's almost time. And uh, so thanks for your attention. And uh, I've been happy to, to give this talk. Great. Well, thanks, Antonio. We really appreciate all the work that you put in for this presentation. I'm now going to send out the survey to everybody and then we'll do some questions. Please answer these anonymously and then we will, um, it'll help us to move through the next presentations if we need to change anything. So there you go. Um, so some questions that have come in for you. Let me get them pulled up here. Um, what mint struck coins uh, uh, for the kingdom? Let me try that again. What mint struck coins for the kingdom of the two Sicilies before the unification? Um, so then the main mint, um, as I said, uh, was uh, mostly Naples. Um, so before, uh, before the restoration, we have, uh, we have other means like, um, like Messina, like Palermo. Uh, but then the, the Bourbon, uh, after the the restoration decided to have just uh, the, the main mint, which was uh, mostly Naples. Naples remain, remain active as a mint uh, until the, the very end of uh, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Um, so I didn't uh, uh, speak about this, but the last king um, in that period was, um, was Francis II, um, which ruled for like a, a very short period, like uh, le, I think one year, uh, between uh, 1859 uh, uh, and 1860. So uh, the last uh, uh, the last coins were issued in in Naples, uh, but mostly Naples. Yes. What do you think is the most important coin in Italian history? Good question. Um, I don't know if I could answer in terms of like collecting value, uh, but um, I don't think there is a, a unique answer to this question. So if we think about the history of, uh, of Italy, um, I should say maybe uh, the, um, the coins uh, maybe of, Frederick II in medieval time uh, because it's international. But if we want to be like uh, close to the med medieval time, I think the Fiorino was quite important because it was uh, widespread and uh, well known. Um, and in terms of value, uh, collecting value, uh, there is a, I think a piece of uh, 100 lira, uh, which is extremely valuable and uh, for collecting is very, uh, well known, and uh, I think uh, in auction sale cost uh, more than one thousand euro, uh, one hundred thousand euro. Sorry. Uh, so, but I think there is not a unique answer to this question. All right. Can you re-say your definition of scudo and what it means? Okay, the scudo. Um, so, scudo technically in. Um, in Italian language means shield. So it's just the nominal value of, of this coin. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a nominal value that we, we don't find only, only on, um, in Sicilian coinage, but as I said, also in, in other coinages of Italy. And uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's another way to say that 
uh, it's, it's a 10 tari coin. So it's like um, um, an equivalent value that, that you have. Um, so, but you have also, um, also other, other, I think there is also a double scud as well. Uh, you also find scudi in, um, in other Spanish coin. So also if you are interested in Spanish coins, for instance, uh, issued in, in, um, in, um, so, uh, in, in South America as well, you, you have scudi. And they were also silver coins. This one says, I have seen at least one Italian coin struck over a Latin American silver coin. What is the source of silver for the coinages of the 17th and 18th centuries? Uh, good question, yes. There were, um, I think this, uh, this kind of, of aspect has not been explored so much. So as you know, for instance, for uh, South America and, um, and also um, Spain, uh, we have um, mostly um, an origin of metal from from there. Uh, I, I guess, uh, um, that if I'm not wrong, there were there are not so many studies on the analysis of of these coins. Um, I think uh, some of them have to be done, um, but I guess uh, I guess still uh, we we can suppose that part of the silver can can come also from uh, overseas as well. But there are not so many studies. So the, the, most of the scholars are, are interested in terms of numismatists in Italy are more interested in ancient coins. So we have done plenty of analysis for instance on, on Roman coins, but not so many on, on those ones. All right. Um, my 1857 Sink Tornesi has a star on the obverse below the bust of the Ferdinand. Is this a mint mark and what does it mean? Um, in which one? 1875? Eight, sorry, 1857, I'm sorry. I can come back. Yes. 1857. Which one? Um, it was just saying my 1857 uh, St. Tornesi has a star on the obverse below the bust of the Ferdinand. Is this Ah, okay. Maybe this one. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's 1859. Yes, sorry. That's why. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's not a um, countermark, um, countermark. It's related to the, to the production of the coins within the, the mint. Um, I think it's the kind of... Um, um, let me see. Yes, it's related to the, um, to the minty, so it's not a counter mark. mark. This is more stuff. What is the most traditional numismatic association in Italy? Oh, yes. Um, so in Italy, we have um, probably, um, let's say, one, um, one main association. Uh, that's, uh, that's why I'm on this slide. Um, so if you see here, you have the name of the, the most well-known association of numismatics in Italy. So it's called Società Numismatica Italiana. Uh, it was founded a long time ago in 1888. I don't know when the ANA was founded, probably in the same period or maybe before, uh, but, but still after the, the main one which was founded for instance, in the UK, in London. Still, a very, it's a very traditional society, uh, which is also uh, promoting this journal. So this journal started when the society was founded. And still, is the, um, you can join the society, you can, you can uh, have a membership, and you can receive this journal. It's like the American, um, the ANA and ANS as well. So they are very similar. There are also plenty of uh, uh, the small society that we call club in, um, in Italy. So there is one in Milan, uh, which I joined a few years ago and I gave also some 
some, um, some talk there is called Circolo Culturale Numismatico Milanese. So all the main uh, cities uh, uh, can have like um, a club of, or society of numismatic. When did Sicily switch from hammer, hammered to screw press coinage and then to powered presses? What did? When did Sicily switch from hammered, screw press coinage and then to powered presses? Um, yeah, this, this occur, um, I guess, in, um, yeah, in, uh, in 18th century, so when we have the, the standard coin. But, but uh, um, in terms of production, uh, we have um, like um, a very modern and efficient production of coins, mostly in 19th century. So that's, that's similar um, in all Europe. So that's why also, as I show you, we have all these standard coins, uh, mostly in 19th century. Uh, but if you notice, the previous one were a bit more irregular, so like the coins that I show on uh, of 16th century. Um, what did the Olim Bamba countermark mean? Their audio cut out when you were explaining it. So if you could explain that again. Ah, okay. Uh, yes. Um, Olim. Yeah, this one, uh, bomb, uh, bomba means bomb, and it's related to the, to the action of the king uh, who decided to bomb the city of Messina in Sicily, uh, just to, um, because he couldn't deal with, uh, with the uprising, so he decided to, to move the, the artillery and bombed the city. So that's why this king, uh, uh, it's called uh, like a joke, uh, the, the bomb king. And that's why the rebels were uh, uh, putting these countermarks on, on the king. And, uh, and olim, olim means, uh, it's a Latin word, it's an adverb, uh, it means once upon a time. And uh, you can see how the, the rebels were clever and they, they still Latin and Italian language. And it's put uh, between uh, Ferdinandus the second, secundus in Latin, and they grazie. So this means that Ferdinand II, once upon a time, was the king. So this means that the rebels did not recognize the king as a king anymore. So it's a form of protest. Do you know anything about the Genose colonies in the Black Sea? Uh, no, that didn't, what do you say? Uh, I'll spell it for you. G N O E S E. Colonies in the Black Sea. Uh, no, no idea. Okay. All right. The next one. Um, do you have any recommendations for beginning to collect and study Italian numismatics? I collect mostly United States coins and some foreign coins, but would love to learn more about Italian numismatics. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think maybe this could be a nice uh, talk for the next year, maybe. Um, yes, Italian numismatics um, can be uh, quite good in terms of collecting. Uh, so um, it depends, of course, on the budget uh, that you have. Uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, if you can find coins in the, in the um, uh, commercial exhibition that you have in, in the US, probably yes, but uh, probably the most common are, um, are the, um, the, the coins of Kingdom of Emmanuel III, which can be quite, quite cheap uh, to be bought. And for instance, you can decide, I don't know, to, to focus on uh, some uh, iconographies or decided to, to like focus on, um, on one um, nominal value, like um, something that you can do also for the US coins, like let's see, uh, one cent of the Italian lira, and then collecting all the issue year by year, that could be quite nice. Um, but also uh, the, the recent coinage that we had in Italy uh, can be quite fascinating for collector. So you can collect Lira and they are still on the market. So I think they are, they are quite, quite cheap. Still, you can also do the series like, uh, like uh, the, um, the US cent, for instance. Uh, 
so there are many aspects that you can develop. All right, we'll do one more since we're out of time. Um, there are a bunch of other questions have come in, so if we don't get to answer your question today, I will be sending all of these questions to Antonio to answer, and then I will get them back out to you as soon as we can. Um, which came first, the English groat, the French gras, or the Italian grasso? Which came from? The, the... Which came first, the English groat, the French gras, or the Italian grasso? Um, I think uh, the Italian, yes, but that should be explored also in archives. Um, but this is quite tricky because sometimes archives tell that a coin is called in one way, but it, it's called in a different uh, way. It depends on the region as well. I think the Italian one. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. We are at time. Like I said, if we didn't get to your questions today, um, I will be sending them to Antonio to answer. Um, if you haven't answered the poll yet, please do before you leave. It'll help us with our future seminars. Um, the next seminar to happen is going to be Introduction to Early U.S. Paper Currency, 1765 to 1865. And that's with Doug Mudd and Richard Horst on Monday, um, July 6th at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. So if you haven't registered for that, there is still a little bit more room for that. I'm going to add the um, link here in just a second. So if you haven't been able to get on to the website in a while, please go to that. Let me get it for you real quick. All right. Here is the link if you um, would like to register for that class or any other ones. We are also putting all of the recordings for all of the classes that have happened this week and that are happening in the future on our website. You can find them on that exact same link. There's going to be a paragraph just below um, on that first paragraph you can use to find all the recordings. I think we've gotten a couple of them on there and we'll keep putting them on there as soon as we can. So thank you everybody. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Antonio. We have a certificate of appreciation coming to you soon. And um, everybody have a great rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao.